Uh, good morning, everybody. So <clears throat> we welcome you all to this IC, uh, which is basically on combined cataract and glaucoma surgery. So combined glaucoma and cataract surgery, we know that he has evolved over times. The conventional treatment options are FACO with trabeculectomy and SICS with trabeculectomy. And now we have uh, several other surgical options that may be needed for some special indications. For example, a patient with cataract and neovascular glaucoma might, ne might need uh, FACO combined with uh, AMET glaucoma valve, or uh, there is a new interest in uh, MIGS procedures. Patients who have mild to moderate open angle glaucoma along with cataract, uh, there you might as well do a MIGS procedure along with a cataract so that you spare the conjunctiva for any subsequent filtration surgery. So there are uh, many surgical options for this patient and there are uh, issues like which one to take for a combined surgery, which one, which patient to ideally uh, choose for FACO alone or trabeculectomy alone. And uh, uh, myself and my co-instructors will try to highlight these points. So we have two very eminent glaucoma specialists with us. Dr. Anil Kumar Mandal, of course, needs no introduction. He is currently senior consultant in Elvit Prashad Eye Institute, and he has uh, very rich experience in combining, uh, in, in treating patients with glaucoma and cataract. And we also have the young and dynamic Dr. Siddharth Dixit, uh, who also has a lot of experience in uh, managing uh, difficult cases of glaucoma and cataract, and he is currently a consultant in Elvit Prashad Eye Institute. So um, I, I would start with uh, the relevant surgical anatomy, and then we would proceed uh, to the FACO trap and SICS trap, and subsequently to the uh, FACO along with the implants and the MIGS procedures. So we will start with the relevant surgical anatomy because whatever glaucoma surgery we do, whether it is a trabeculectomy or whether it's a valve implant or whether it is an MIGS procedure, we, we must be acquainted with the uh, surgical anatomy so that our treatment outcomes are optimal. So I have no financial relationship to disclose. So, so to uh, uh, the knowledge of both the internal and the external anatomy of the limbal area is essential for successful incisional surgery. Uh, trabeculectomy, as we know, is a girded partial thickness filtering procedure, which is performed by removal of a block of peripheral corneal tissue beneath the scleral flap. Although the name is trabeculectomy, it is somewhat a misnomer because most of the times we remove a piece of the corneal tissue. Now, in a strict sense, the tra term trabeculectomy is therefore inaccurate because the procedure usually involves a peripheral posterior keratectomy rather than removal of a trabeculum meshwork. Now, how uh, do we achieve the IOP control in trabeculectomy? What is the basic principle? So, the IOP lowering effect of trabeculectomy is achieved by the generation of a fistula that connects the anterior chamber to the subconjunctival space. So a fistula has to be there. It does not matter whether it is at the level of the trabecular meshwork or at the level of the peripheral cornea, but there must be a patent fistula, and all of our efforts are uh, to maintain that fistula throughout the patient's life so that there is a constant flow of aqueous. And removal of the trabecular meshwork is not required to achieve this result. We just need a fistula. So. Uh, uh, these particular slides are in relation to the phaco trabeculectomy. What are the anatomical principles so that we can make the uh, surgery more successful? So the first part of any surgery is proper exposure of the surgical area. So when we are doing a trabeculectomy, there must be a good exposure of the superior uh, conjunctiva where we are planning the uh, trabeculectomy, superior, supernasal, or uh, superotemporal, whatever area we are choosing. Now, a corneal or a limbal traction suture can rotate the globe down, providing excellent exposure of the superior sulcus and limbus. So we know that the exposure can be achieved either by a clear corneal traction suture or by a superior rectus brittle suture. So when we are using the superior rectus suture, you can see uh, that this, this is the, uh, this is the um, uh, superior rectus forceps. And from the tip, around 7.7 .7 millimeter from the tip, there is a bend here. And this is constructed in such a way that if you put these uh, edges, the uh, tips of these forceps at the level of the limbus, uh, uh, automatically, 
I mean, I mean, if you put this bend of the limbus, automatically the tips will catch the insertion of the superior rectus muscle. So Next is preparation of the conjunctival wound. Now, this is uh, I, this I think is the most important part of the dissection because unless you get a proper conjunctival dissection, you will get you will not get a proper diffuse bleb. So the purpose is to dissect as far posteriorly as possible so that the dissection is not localized because if it is localized, we'll only get a small uh, localized uh, bleb and uh, uh, this might leak in future. So what we want is a more diffuse and posterior flow. So what are the principles? For, uh, we have to remember that the insertion of the conjunctiva onto the cornea is variable and often it is more anterior than expected. So we know that the conjunctiva inserts first and the, the uh, tenons insert somewhat posterior to this. And approximately 1.5 millimeter from the limbus, the tenons capsule fuses with the underlying episclera. So first we have to, by sharp dissection, we have to uh, dissect the uh, insertion of the conjunctiva. Then we have to separately dissect the insertion of the tenons. And the key is to free the tenons fascia from the episclera and then grasp the edges of both the conjunctiva and the tenons when separating the two layers from the rest of the underlying sclera. So by first sharp dissection, we have to first cut the uh, edge of the conjunctiva, then the edge of the tenons. Then our scissors must go beneath the tenons so that we are dissecting beneath the tenons. So we have to um, reach the correct plane. It should not be between the conjunctiva and the tenons. Then the surgery will not be successful. Then after we have uh, created the partial thickness scleral flap, this is the surgical anatomy of the limbus and it's very important to understand that from posterior to anterior we have these structures. There is a sclera, there is a scleral spur, there is a blue zone and there is a cornea. It is here where we have to make the uh, deeper flap. So this uh, surgical limbus of the blue zone is a 1.5 millimeter transitional zone. And how do you identify the scleral spar? The scleral spar is a white glistening band which is located posterior to the blue zone. And this anatomy varies widely and must be determined in intraoperatively. We must be able to identify what is the level of the scleral spar intraoperatively. We must not go behind the scleral spar because of the dissection, because of the risk of damage to the ciliary body and bleeding. We must not go too anterior also. And a perpendicular incision made at the sclerolimbal junction would enter the anterior chamber at the level of the anterior trabecular mesho can solve his line. And remember that the Schlem's canal is located directly anterior to the scleral spar. So this is the ideal position where you have to make the block, whether you do it with uh, scissors or we, we do it with a punch. So the scleral spar, so under a partial thickness scleral flap, the external landmark of the scleral spar is a circumferential ring of white scleral fibers. So the scleral fibers are located uh, anteroposterally, but the scleral spar will be visible as a circumferential ring of white scleral spurs. This is identified in stark contrast to the juxtaposed longitudinal fibers of the scleral bed. So if a <coughs> phonics-based conjunctival flap is used, it's best to avoid dissecting the flap anteriorly into the clear cornea I mean too much into the clear cornea, about 1 to 1.5 millimeter is okay, uh, since anterior flap dissection facilitates an early wound leakage. And there is no advantage in extending the block posteriorly into the sclera, and the risk of bleeding from the iris root and ciliary body is greater. So it should be the site of the deep scleral block excision should, not, should be just optimal. You should not dissect too much anteriorly into the sclera, just about one millimeter or 1.5 millimeter, not more than that. And again, you should not go beyond the scleral spar. Now regarding the scleral, uh, sclerostomy, the aqueous drainage is generally not restricted by the size of the sclerostomy. Unless it's abnormally small, the aqueous restriction is usually not restricted. However, the sclerostomy must be large enough to avoid occl occlusion by the iris, but small enough so that it is overlapped on all sides by scleral flap. So what it means is that it should not be eccentric. You should not cut, make a scleral flap here, or else there will be too much of flow here, or eccentrically here, or there will be too much flow from here. It should be just central. And it should be reasonably big enough so that it is not occluded by the iris. Although you're doing an iridectomy, uh, in, in some cases you, you can get a shallow AC and the internal ostium can be closed by iris. So regarding the iridectomy, an iridectomy is performed to reduce the risk of iris occluding the sclerostomy, especially in fecic eyes, and to prevent pupillary block. So of course, we have to do combine an iridectomy with a uh, trabeculectomy. And care should be taken to avoid amputation of the ciliary processes or disruption of the zonal fibers or hyoid phase. 
Okay, so that ends the, uh, the uh, anatomical part, the relevant surgical anatomy. Uh, there is also another part of the anatomy which is important, which uh, Dr. Siddharth will discuss uh, in relation to the, the gonioscopic anatomy that is important for the FACO combined with the MIGS procedures. Okay, I'll now move on to the next presentation, which is, which is the uh, management of combined cataract and glaucoma. Uh, in, with particular reference to phacotrabiculectomy. So as we know, cataract and glaucoma are common conditions. They often coexist. There is no general consensus on surgical management, like whom we should go for combined surgery, whom we should go for cataract surgery first, and whom who, who, who should go for glaucoma surgery first. So there are options of combined surgery and stage, stage surgery. And the decision has to be individualized based on the severity of glaucoma, the visual compromise due to cataract, etc. So what are the benefits of cataract surgery on glaucoma? If you do cataract surgery alone in a glaucoma patients, this might be of benefit somewhat. Why and how much? So first of all, it will help in reduction of intraocular pressure. So it is uh, both in, uh, uh, it is in primary open angle glaucoma, it is primary angle closure glaucoma, and it is in pseudo exfoliation glaucoma. In all these three conditions, you will get a somewhat reduction of intraocular pressure. In pseudo exfoliation, you get a significant reduction in intraocular pressure. Now, what are the other benefits of doing cataract surgery in a glaucoma patient? If it's an angle closure glaucoma, it will help to deepen the anterior chamber, and therefore your subsequent maneuvers during phacoemulsification become much easier. Next, if there is easier, easier management of post-operative complications of glaucoma surgery, like a shallow SE. So if you have a patient of shallow SE, it is very difficult to manage if the patient is phacic. But uh, if the patient is pseudo phacic, then the uh, uh, management becomes much easier. Then, uh, if it's a tube, if, if you're planning a, a FACO along with a tube implant, again, the tube implant is easier in a pseudo phacic eye. Because in some cases, you, can, you, you, can, you need to put the tube behind the iris also in the sulcus. And if it's a pseudo phacic eye, it's much easier. Then, it does not subject the filtration procedure to the stress of a later cataract surgery. And there's better follow up for glaucoma, like better fills, OCT, disc photo. If the cataract is removed, definitely, the patient will be able to perform this test better. Now, what is the mechanism of the IOP reduction by FACO? In angle closure disease, as we have discussed, there is opening up of the mechanically blocked anterior chamber angle, a sh a shallow AC and the uh, narrow angles because of the large size of the lens. All these factors will now be gone. Now, in open angle glaucoma, there are various hypotheses how a FACO can help in uh, reducing the intraocular pressure. So some of the theories are like reduction in the deposition of glycosaminoglycans in the trabecular meshwork. Then inflammatory mediators released during cataract surgery can cause modulation of the extracellular matrix of the trabecular meshwork. Alterations in the blood aqueous, aqueous barrier, changes in the anterior chamber architecture, all these will help. Now, how much is the IOP reduction by FACO alone? So just remember that if it is an ocular hypertension or primary open angle glaucoma, the amount of IOP reduction that you will get is around 1.8 to 4.5 millimeter of mercury. And the IOP reduction is more if the starting IOP is high. If it is pseudo exfoliation, then it is about, it is somewhat higher. It's about four to five millimeter of mercury. Now, if it is primary angle closure, then it will depend on the extent of sinical closure. If there's a lot of sinical closure, so 270 degree or 360 degree, the, ang the angle is totally occluded by sinicky, then you will not get much IOP lowering by doing the FACO alone. But if there is a significant amount of appositional closure, then if you do a cataract surgery, the amount of IOP lowering will be much better. And uh, this will be uh, about 2 to 8 millimeter of mercury IOP reduction, and on, of, on an average, it would be around 6 millimeter of mercury IOP reduction. So combined surgery has its advantages, but it has its disadvantages also. Advantages are obvious, like for convenience to the patient, there's a reduction in cost because there will be a single surgery rather than two surgeries, avoids the stress of multiple surgeries in comorbid condi conditions. There are social issues, like some attendant has to, has to come twice. Then it avoids the potential post-operative IOP spike. This is very important. Uh, the post-operative IOP spike uh, is something that we uh, dread in case of advanced glaucomas. And long-term IOP control from glaucoma surgery and quick visual recovery from cataract surgery. But the disadvantages if you do a combined surgery is that there will be a longer visual recovery. And it's the combined surgery may be technically more difficult if there's coexisting small pupils, zonular laxity, et cetera. So by and large, the common indications for FACO would be early to moderate glaucoma. And if the glaucoma is well controlled, 
on one or two uh, uh, drops for trabeculectomy if it is a if the glaucoma is very severe and there is uncontrolled iop or pro progression despite maximal therapy and the cataract is minimal phacotrab would be a significant cataract uncontrolled glaucoma economic issues and compliance issues but please do not rely on the iop reducing ability of cataract surgery alone in advanced primary open angle glaucoma pacg or pxf a uh, phaco alone will reduce iop somewhat but in case of advanced glaucoma please consider a combined surgery so uh, the preoperative assessment would con uh, would include a vision and a rpd check a comprehensive eye examination then you are doing both cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery so regarding the cataract take a special note about the pupil diameter if it is small you may require some pupil dilating devices keep that handy the hardness of the cataract you may need some additional special viscoelastic devices specular microscopy look at the pseudo exfoliation look at the zonal integrity and be uh, attentive during biometry regarding glaucoma look at the ocular surface conjunctiva gonioscopy applanation tonometry pachymetry visual fields oct or nfl um, in particular if the patient is on long term glaucoma medications the uh, ocular surface will be very Uh, congested and you have to put some lubricants and some topical steroids to make the surface uh, healthy before you take up the patient for surgery so what are the options for combined surgery we have phaco trabeculectomy we will show a surgical video of that and then uh, the phaco migs like phaco along with eye stent or some other uh, migs procedures which dr siddharth will co cover phaco plus npgs is not so popular now and phaco plus glaucoma drainage device again dr siddharth will co cover and phaco plus sic um, uh, sics plus trap that dr mandal will cover now <coughs> regarding the surgical technique of phaco trabeculectomy uh, first of all is anesthesia we usually prefer a peribulbar anesthesia although some surgeons might do it in a, a, a topical anesthesia also keep the iris hooks re ready the phaco technique should be standard and it should be uncomplicated because you do not need any phaco complications that will adversely affect the outcome of the glaucoma surgery as well now whether to go for premium iols well toric iols may be considered were suitable but multifocal iols the data is lacking whether we should use it or not this can theoretically reduce the contrast sensitivity and probably at this point of time it is preferable to avoid them now thorough irrigation and aspiration must be done and we should remove the trapped viscoelastic because we do not need any post surgical spike um okay so now we'll come to the um, video but before that let's see what are the wga cons consensus world glaucoma association consensus on combined cataract and glaucoma surgery i will just uh, 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 highlight the important points a combined procedure is usually indicated when surgery for iop lowering is appropriate and a visually significant cataract is present there is limited evidence evidence to differentiate a limbal versus a fornix based conjunctival incision for combined surgery therefore surgeon preference and experience will dictate the choice and combined procedure a less successful for iop reduction than trabeculectomy alone so now let's go to the uh, surgical technique uh, that i preferred in phaco trabeculectomy so after the conjunctival exposure which in this case we have done by the superior rectus brittle sutures i'm now using uh, sponges soaked in mitomycin c i use about 0.4 mg per ml for 2 minutes in most of the cases some uh, surgeons can also do uh, an injection of the mitomycin c then this is a two side trabeculectomy i now shift to the temporal position and now i do a uh, um, uh, uh, the um, rexis and the size of the rexis should be slightly smaller than what you do in a normal phaco cases because in the post operative condition there may be shallow ac and there might be a tendency for the lens to pop out of the back so now this is a clear corneal uh, incision phaco incision so this is a superior trabeculectomy or a superior nasal trabeculectomy and a temporal clear corneal incision the uh, the hydro dissection and the phaco technique whatever phaco technique we are comfortable with uh, be it stop and chop be direct chop whatever technique we are comfortable with uh, we will go along with that uh, and we would make sure that we do not uh, have any undue complications during the surgery so after the phaco emulsification is completed the nucleus is emulsified and the cortex is aspirated by bimanual irrigation aspiration a foldable intraocular lens is placed inside the capsular bag and this is this step is very important we have to put a suture in the 
a corneal incision this is unlike a normal phaco this is because in the post operative period you might have to give globe massage and uh, mm, th this wound must be secured so now we again shift superiorly and we now go uh, proceed with the trabeculectomy so this is a triangular based scleral flap uh, what we have learned from our teachers like dr mandal in lv prashad institute although some surgeons can prefer a rectangular scleral flap also and studies have shown that the geometry does not really uh, influence the outcome so this is about 50 to 70 percent thickness we should do it in a single plane the anatomy must be uh, visible to us so as we go forward uh, we carry a dissection a little forward into the clear cornea uh, and then uh, i hold the, the 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 assistant holds the tip of the scleral flap with a suture and now i'm making the deep scleral block dissection you should not go behind the scleral spar as we have discussed earlier and this is the dissection of the scleral block and i'm doing it under direct vision by the VLANS knife, I'm not using a punch, although you may use that as well. And now I'm doing an iridectomy. So everything, every step is done in a well-controlled well, well manner under direct supervision. And then I'm putting a single uh, apical suture with 10 nylon. And the most important step, I think, in the phacotrabeculectomy part is how you tight uh, tighter the tightness of this suture. The tightness is will be such that there will be reasonable flow of aqueous to the anterior chamber, but the AC should not shallow. There should not be overfiltration. So over a period of time, we understand how much would be the tightness by the pressure that we exert with our hands, and then we bury this, bury this suture. Now, very important is to put a releasable suture because this will create, this will help us to avoid a lot of cases of post-operative shallow AC. So we, I put a moderately tight uh, apical suture. It is not too tight. Uh, and now I put a reasonably tight, this releasable suture. So I take one bite through the peripheral clear cornea, one bite through the central limbus, and the third bite through the sides. And this is, uh, then, then, then I um, take the throws in such a way that I tie a knot without locking it. So post-operatively, after about one week, I can release this releasable suture. So there is a fixed apical suture, and there is a releasable suture at one side. If there is overfiltration, I can put another suture also, another releasable suture on another <coughs> side. And this is also another very important step, is to make this conjunctival wound watertight. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a bite through the peripheral limbus, and I am taking a bite through the conjunctiva, and I'm using uh, 80 Vicryl here. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to slightly overlap the conjunctival edge over the limbus so that we can get a watertight wound. So I take one bite from one side and then another bite from another. And if necessary, I can uh, take more bites with this H0 vicryl suture. But what we must ensure is that the conjunctival wound must absolutely be watertight. To make it further secure, what I do is I take a... Uh, uh, 8 0 10 0 nylon suture these are uh, sort of mattresses mattress sutures so i take through the clear cornea come out through a clear cornea then i take it out through the conjunctiva and i put two sutures on each side so that the conjunctival wound becomes absolutely watertight there is no chance of post operative leakage and um, uh, i usually put uh, an air bubble so that the anterior chamber is maintained i patch the eye for the day and the patient goes home with the patch and the next day the patient comes i remove the patch and we put steroid drops frequently about uh, six to eight times a day along with topical antibiotic eye drops and along with cyclopragic drops it can be homatropine or it can be atropine so this is the end of the surgery we get a formed ac and we get a good bleb as we inject uh, saline through the side port so uh, th that, that is the end of this, um, uh, this phacotrabeculectomy procedure. Uh, if you have any questions, we can take at the end of the session uh, for the benefit of time. And I would now, now request Dr. Anil Mandal to uh, demonstrate the technique of uh, SICS trabeculectomy. And at the end, uh, also I would request him to discuss uh, the post-operative care that we should take for uh, patients who are doing combined cataract and glaucoma surgery. Uh, sir. Pointer is there? There is it? Pointer there. Is it? Yeah. So I'll uh, 
the slide is not required. I'll present only video. Uh, before, uh, do not start video now, I'll, I'll tell. Before I uh, present my uh, video, uh, which is a simple technique of uh, SICS trabeculectomy, combined SICS with trabeculectomy. Uh, uh, let me go back uh, to my residency days and my milestones of development as a surgeon, tackling cases of cataract and glaucoma combined. Now, in my residency days, including my fellowship days uh, in RP Center and before that in NRS Medical College, uh, Kolkata, we saw how the uh, evolution has taken place, surgical evolution, in the management of cataract. Do not uh, play the video now. You can stop the video. Um, how the thing has evolved over a period of time. In my house job period, I have seen my professor, Professor G. N. Uh, Seal, used to do ICC with uh, trabeculectomy. After that, in RP Center, I have seen ECC with trabeculectomy. And then, FECO, when I was in LV Prasad, I saw FECO for the first time for cataract surgery. And then, FECO trabeculectomy came. So this is the steps of development. Now, all of us know how quickly the cataract surgery has changed over decades, from ICC to ECC to FECO emulsification, and different technique and technology has given us relatively safer technique and sophisticated technique. Compared to that, glaucoma surgery has not changed much. We have seen trabeculectomy introduced by Krenz in 1968. With little modification, the same technique is the gold standard for management of glaucoma. And when we consider cataract and glaucoma in the management, combined technique, the same trabeculectomy is done. Additional thing may be use of intraoperative mitomycin C or 5-FU or little more modification in the surgical technique. Now, surgical technique, each of us tell that I have my own style of doing surgery. Each of us tell. Knowingly or unknowingly, it expresses our own satisfaction or ego, whatever you call, as a surgeon. I believe surgical style is the expression of personality and training exhibited by the movements of the fingers and instruments. Its hallmarks are dexterity and gentleness. Whatever you do, do in a very scientific way, keeping anatomical knowledge, knowledge of anatomy in mind, and the physiology and philosophy. Here comes the contradiction. When we do cataract surgery alone, our aim is to make watertight wound so that there will be no leakage. Compared to that, the very goal of filtering surgery or trabeculectomy is to have an wound which will leak lifelong, our expectation, to maintain the intraocular pressure at a safe level. It's, uh, you know, contradiction to uh, physiology and uh, uh, the uh, physiological uh, thing. So we'll have to do surgery in a way that filtration will take place, pressure will remain under control, cataract surgery will be done, and it will not lead to, our expectation is, not lead to shallow chamber or overfiltration related complication in one hand, and on the other hand, it should not lead to high pressure in spite of combined surgery. So you'll have to do surgery in a very meticulous way. Um, I'll present the uh, video. My learning, just wait one minute. Uh, my learning has been little different from probably standard teaching or learning or milestones of learning of today's uh, residents. I have learned SICS, then ECC, then combined cat, um, you know, ECC uh, with intraocular lens implantation, and then went straight away to FECO. SICS, for me, learning has been little late. While I was working in LV Prasad, we felt that this is a technique which must be learned and must be taught, and before we teach, we must learn ourselves. And that's why, after 10 years of my work at LV Prasad, I took a step backward, actually, 
to learn SICS, little uh, difficulty was hesitation because when, when you learn FECO very well and you are doing, you feel that uh, you are going backward. The journey is not really so. It's a very good technique, simple technique, and it is not dependent on, ex uh, you know, extensive, uh, I'll say, costly machine, FECO. I'm sure even if we say that in practice in the urban areas, uh, you know, everybody has access to FECO machine, there are situations and set up where FECO machine is just not available. You'll have to manage cataract and glaucoma, and lots of patients with advanced glaucoma with uh, total cataract or, uh, you know, different uh, cataract in different stages. That's why uh, I learned SICS. Over a period of time, I realized that FECO trabeculectomy and SICS trabeculectomy, from the point of view of efficacy of intraocular pressure control, is not very different, almost equal. And it is the difficult situation where probably SICS trabeculectomy will be more will be preferred compared to phago trabeculectomy, like very small people, bound down people, and hypermature cataract, or cataract on the other hand, when it is very rock hard cataract, SICS will give you an advantage over phago. Whatever sophistication is the technique, or uh, I'll say uh, phago machine wise, whatever efficient machine you have in the rock hard four plus uh, grade nucleus, will give some amount of endothelial damage compared to SICS, where SICS will probably be a preferred technique. By that, I don't mean that, uh, uh, you know, you should not uh, uh, learn FECO. FECO is the fashion of the day. There is no, uh, you know, there is nothing to stress that it is the technique to be learned, most sophisticated technique. But if done properly, SICS and FECO gives almost uh, comparable result, except in the early few postoperative days, after one month, uh, you know, you can get equally good result compared to FECO. With this little background, let me explain this technique. Uh, the technique here, uh, can you uh, continue playing the uh, video? You can see here, fornix paste conjunctival flap in the usual way, and uh, Superficial blood vessels are cauterized with the help of, uh, you know, cautery. Here is a patient who is having uh, moderate to advanced cataract with uh, pupil moderately dilated, not very well dilated. A very straight incision is given about 1.5 millimeter from the uh, conjunctival this insertion, and you go in a lamellar way, the way we do in SICS, and make the pocket so that it will help in nucleus delivery. Enter into the anterior chamber. Because the pupil was less dilated, I put a weak adrenaline solution under the pupillary margin to have little more uh, dilatation so that I can do without any iris manipulation or any procedure on the iris. The Capsulotomy is done. I used to uh, do capsulotomy. And here is a situation one can use dye to visualize the uh, capsulotomy technique intraoperatively. I do not uh, believe in that. Uh, you know, in most of the situation we can manage. And here is a situation capsulotomy is taking place actually under the pupillary margin and completion is done. After that, the hydro procedure is done in the usual fashion. Here is a large nuclear uh, cataract and a rotation is being attempted so that your hydro procedure is good. And uh, some soft cortex <coughs> is uh, removed just to debulk because the capsule, capsulotomy was little, uh, I'll say moderate uh, size, I made a technique that the one edge of the nucleus is out of the bag and then with the help of Sinsky hook, you are rotating the large nucleus out of the bag. A very simple technique, it's the question of learning the trick 
so that you don't have to give any relaxing incision and you can be sure that your lens is all in the bag. And then the viscoexpression of the entire large nucleus. Uh, here the incision is about 6, 6.5 millimeter straight incision and with the viscoexpression the nucleus is uh, getting out of the wound. In difficult situation, there are procedures where you can do break the nucleus and you can do the re nucleus removal in piecemeal in few quadrant. Some more uh, visco is injected to remove the epinucleus and then the irrigation and aspiration technique will be done in the usual way. Lot of viscoelastic should be used to protect the endothelium. And uh, you can see here, now with the help of uh, Simco irrigation and aspiration cannula, residual cortex is removed and makes sure that the removal of the cortex is 100%. Once uh, you complete the removal of the um, residual cortex, viscoelastic should be injected. And you can see here, I am not using the bent cannula, j shaped cannula, uh, in situations uh, where it is difficult, j shaped cannula helps removal of the sub-incisional cortex in the upper part, which is lying behind the iris and in the capsular uh, you know, equator. Viscoelastic is injected into the bag and then the lens is implanted. You can use foldable lens uh, without folding because your wound is reasonably large and you can really put the lens in the bag. Whatever lens you prefer is okay but the power calculation should be good so that, you know, unaided vision will be very good. With the help of, uh, with the help of continued uh, injection of viscoelastic, I'm just trying to put the optic in the bag and then with the Sinsky hook is uh, doing the maneuver to put the upper haptic in the capsular bag. Make sure, uh, you know, the, the lens is in the bag and to check that in all quadrant. <coughs> After that, the most important part of uh, the thing here in relation to combined and cataract and glaucoma. I put a tenon nylon suture to the anterior lip for the upper, uh, the anterior lip to be retracted by the surgeon holding the posterior lip, an incision is given with the micro, uh, you know, uh, instrument and the trabeculectomy part should be done under direct visualization, three by one millimeter tissue or three by two millimeter tissue is removed. I prefer to make a good uh, uh, internal block. One can use uh, punch to remove the deeper block to uh, do uh, create the trabeculectomy opening. I am comfortable with freehand dissection and then the iridectomy is done. Here one should keep in mind that the base of the iridectomy should be equal or even little larger than the base uh, than the uh, internal ostia made. Make sure that the uh, you know iridectomy is seen properly and uh, then Again, irrigation aspiration of the viscoelastic material and two sutures I use, one on each side of the internal, uh, you know, ostium made. Just tenonylon suture. As I told, irrigation aspiration of the viscoelastic is done and the, su uh, the surgery is nearing uh, towards the end one suture here, one on either, uh, either each side of the uh, internal block made. <coughs> Just making sure that the viscoelastic uh, trapped uh, 
behind the lens and anterior to the posterior capsule is removed properly and the closure here I just uh, do a position not too, too, too much tightness just the position uh, one is probably little, little more uh, tighter than the other the other will be given little looser an attempt should be made to make sure that the chamber depth is adequate and the gap between this suture is such that it will lead to some filtration in the post-operative period. Here I have not made any side incision or paracentesis opening. One can do that in standard cataract as well as cataract and glaucoma surgery. I do not make any side incision. That's the way I do, but uh, you are free to make uh, uh, you know, paracentesis opening on either side to check the filtration, how it is happening. Uh, I do not really uh, do that. Checking that intraoperatively has nothing to do with the postoperative result. Um, <coughs> the trick here is pull the conjunctive or tenon layer, give uh, permanent uh, suture on each side here, pulling in a way and making sure that the conjunctive is pulled and then uh, the needle is passed so that this part of the conjunctive tenon layer will press over the peripheral part of the cornea at 12 o'clock position and whatever filtration takes place will be directed posteriorly. There will be no anterior leakage. I do not give any uh, suture here, conjunctive tenon with the peripheral cornea. Some people used to give, I believe, in my hand, this technique works very well. So this is the way, standard way I do. And uh, I do not check how much filtration ha is taking place intraoperatively. Can you stop the video? Uh, please stop the video. So uh, you have, please stop the video. Close the video is over. All right. So uh, about the postoperative management, it is uh, nothing uh, different from trachotabulectomy. Uh, standard antibiotic uh, for a week and uh, uh, cycloplegic uh, drop probably three to four weeks, three times daily cyclopentolate, and then steroid in tapering doses, starti starting say six times uh, daily over a period of time um, for a six weeks period, we stop the um, steroid. And uh, the follow-up schedule is we do the procedure on OPD basis in the very first day we open the patch, see vision and then uh, do check the intraocular pressure and then prescribe medicine, call the patient after one week. And after that, again after five weeks, at sixth week visit, we do final refraction and give the refractive correction. Now in case where there is borderline pressure or little on the higher side pressure, in the first postoperative day after removal of the patch and checking intraocular pressure, vision, etc., we give little digital compression to really check the efficacy of the internal ostium, how it is functioning or filtration taking place. And that is done under supervision in the slit lamp, retracting the upper eyelid with one finger and with uh, the other finger, you just press little bit at six o'clock position behind the limbus. You will see that fluid is collecting or the blade is increasing with time and a controlled pressure will give you an idea how much uh, filtration you want to see in the first postoperative day. If your pressure is all right within say 10, 12, 14 millimeter of mercury, there is no need to do that. This I'm telling if the pressure is about 21, 22 or uh, in that range on the upper side of normal, you do test that and that test uh, can be done in the uh, one week visit or even after uh, that uh, within a month, it works uh, very well. So this is the standard way I manage in the postoperative uh, phase. Uh, this is, I feel that uh, it's a very 
safe, simple, quick, effective, and inexpensive way of doing cataract and glaucoma surgery where combined surgery is required. Uh, I'll uh, stop here and any question we can uh, discuss in the end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir, for the excellent demonstration of the very meticulous surgical technique. We know, <laughs> we all know that uh, your surgery is like a poetry. So uh, uh, we can take a few questions, one or two questions, before we invite Dr. Siddharth for the other uh, surgical techniques. If there are any questions for the, uh, from the audience regarding phacotrabeculectomy or SICS trabeculectomy. Before the audience comes in, uh, Dr. Mandal, I would like to again like I have always done, I appreciate uh, the demonstration of the video. And it is not only a learning in the surgical technique, but also a demonstration of how you should be recording the videos. When you see Dr. Mandal operate, never at any point of time is the tissue being handled out of focus, out of center. So that meticulous technique, and when you ask Dr. Mandal for a video, he says, okay, take the uh, video from the last case. For us, you have to think, Okay, how was the recording, whether it went on well or not. Dr. Mandal says, okay, just take the last surgery and, and it is actually that good. So I, I've always learned from it. Thank you, um, Siddharth. Uh, both uh, Devasis and uh, Siddharth did uh, fellowship, long-term fellowship of glaucoma with us. Uh, both of them are doing so excellent, uh, you know, um, perfect. In the learning phase, I always say, see surgery of different surgeons who are doing and learn from each surgeon the step which you feel you'll be able to emulate and will be able to do your best. It's not that this is the way to go, no. That's a very dogmatic statement. There are different ways of doing same thing, but yes, scientific standard and uh, you know anatomy and physiology must be respected. And after that, important thing is meticulousness of surgery, the way we express the tissue respect, respect while you are handling the tissue. That's very good. I believe basic surgical skill rises from innate manual ability, expanded in training, and perfected in experience. So it's the question of each of us have our own innate ability, technical skill, Whatever we do, not just surgery, any, any, any work we do, we have our own skill. And that baseline skill, I'm sure all of you will, uh, you will agree with me, is little different in different individuals. But the question is learning. In the learning phase, in the training period, each and every person can be trained if the person himself is interested in improving his skill. With that, you can come to a stage where you are very safe to the patient, very safe surgeon, and you can do the job excellent. Yes, there are situations, surgery is an art, all of you will agree. Probably that experience and uh, long-term, uh, you know, doing the same job again and again, you'll improve. Again, at the final stage, even with 10, 20, 30 years of experience, 10 different people running in the uh, track will not be able to do the uh, same thing. But beyond a certain uh, phase, the skill or the artistry is different, that's okay. But so far, surgical results are concerned, everybody, everybody can do safe and uh, predictable surgery, I, I believe so. Thank you, sir, for such lovely words of wisdom. And I would now, now request Dr. Siddharth uh, to... Uh, I, I have a few questions oh, yeah. uh, for combined surgery right. that I think will be helpful to everyone. Uh, Dr. Devashis, are there situations where you see a significant cataract, uh, you are planning to do a trabeculectomy, uh, but you don't want to do the uh, cataract surgery at the same time? Are there situations in general practice that you have? where you would not operate on a significant cataract, do only the trap? Um, very, very, very few situations will probably be there, like a very advanced glaucoma, very, very, very advanced glaucoma, uh, where the patient really needs very low pressures. 
So uh, it is known that uh, the in terms of IOP control, if you do a trabeculectomy alone, then the pressure reduction is somewhat lower. Um, uh, the the pressure pressure reduction is better if you do a combined surgery. So if if the pressure needs IOP in the very low teens, uh, so then then probably I would go for uh, um, uh, this surgery alone, the uh, uh, glaucoma surgery alone, and li leave the rest for the, the cataract surgery for a later date. Also, if it's a complicated type of cataract, so it's an it's an UVIT cataract with a very high IOP. So there, I don't want to combine the two surgeries for there will be undue inflammation, uh, or a neovascular glaucoma with some cataract. I want to do a glaucoma surgery first, control the IOP. And later on, maybe after three, four months, when the situation is better, I can go ahead with the cataract surgery. Great. And uh, in my experience, I would like uh, corroboration from Dr. Mandel. Uh, do you think that in combined surgeries, you have lower incidence of thin cystic blebs compared to plain trabeculectomies? Yeah, yes. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, trabeculectomy or even SICS trabeculectomy, do not give that kind of blebe appearance as we see in isolated trabeculectomy with or without mitomycin. Even then, the pressure control wise things are okay. That's the one thing, observation. And uh, the moment you use mitomycin intraoperatively, chances of thin cystic blebe is very, very common. You'll have to really apply mitomycin in a very scientific way, more posterior application under the conjunctive or tenon layer, multiple sponge, and the precautions, usual standard, are to be maintained so that you don't end in uh, thin cystic blebe or unhealthy blebe, which in the long run will lead to spontaneous leakage, chances of infection, blebitis, bleb-related infection, and endophthalmitis. In primary surgery where I am doing cataract and glaucoma combined, I really do not use mitomycin. Very rarely, extremely rarely. Most of the, I'll say 90% of the situation, I do not use mitomycin. And in primary surgery for trabeculectomy also, I don't believe in using mitomycin in all cases. Here I differ from the surgeons of the Western world or some surgeons of India. Mitomycin is used for glaucoma surgery almost invariably, you can say. I believe that's a very uh, tricky thing. I'll not say who is wrong, who is right. Long-term results will tell. But the moment you use mitomycin, you are inviting sequelae, which can lead to complications in the form of leakage, blebe related infection, and endophthalmitis. While conjunctiva is very thin and the tenon is not thick, you can do very well simple surgery without using, uh, you know, unmodulating agent. Yes, I understand in younger patient where tenon's capsule is thick, where refractory glaucoma or, pra or some real indications for using mitomycin, you can use that. Even then, use of mitomycin should be very meticulous and uh, you don't face complications in the long run. Uh, Siddharth, you are telling about situation where cataract and glaucoma is there, but you prefer to do glaucoma surgery first, followed by cataract surgery at a later date. I'm going to the other extreme, where cataract and glaucoma, and glaucoma is also very high, cataract uh, is also very mature, like mature or hypermature, like phacolytic glaucoma, lens-induced phacomorphic glaucoma, total cataract with phacomorphic glaucoma and uh, phacolytic glaucoma. Patient has come with uh, maybe pressure over, over 60 millimeter, 50, 60 millimeter of mercury. These are situations where really cataract surgery alone is sufficient. Particularly, I'm talking phacolytic glaucoma. It is lens-induced glaucoma. Lens protein is leaking, giving intense reaction, and uh, the chamber is deep. Here, synechia doesn't form. Inflammation may be, uh, little inflammation may be there that you take care preoperatively and do very meticulous cataract surgery alone, it will be fine with intraocular lens also. In phacomorphic glaucoma, we have realized our retrospective data analysis taught us 
that we, I used to believe that probably more than one week or 10 days uh, phacomotory glaucoma remaining, probably the patient will require triple procedure, cataract and glaucoma combined. That's not true actually. It has been established beyond doubt in the literature in glaucoma that two, three, four weeks phacomotory glaucoma, you just do cataract surgery alone take care of the glaucoma part preoperatively, intraoperatively, in the early postoperative period, your glaucoma will be under control. In rare situations, you may have to supplement with anti-glaucoma medication in the early postoperative period for few weeks, but in the long run, ultimately visual acuity outcome and intraocular pressure control we realize is better where in this situation, uh, phacomotric glaucoma, where only cataract surgery has been done compared to a group where triple procedure has been done. Chances of intraoperative and even postoperative complications are relatively more in such situation. That's the standard knowledge we believe and that is also established in the literature. Sir, one, one, for one question. Uh, patient with one eye region and he had Uh, what is the disc change and uh, field change, etc., um, overall glaucoma status? Field change is stationary. But uh, glaucoma is uh, not under control with multiple medication. No, yeah. Even after three drugs, sometimes uh, pressure goes beyond control. I, I, I'll prefer to do uh, combined surgery, combined cataract and glaucoma surgery. Whatever you do, explain the situation, educate <coughs> the patient. The patient, should, uh, it's our duty and responsibility to make sure the patient understand what we are doing. In case postoperatively medication is required, patient cannot question. You have done glaucoma surgery and you are again giving glaucoma medication. What is this? What you have done? <laughs> that kind of situation. No, even in situations like these, when you have a controlled stable glaucoma and you need more than three drugs. Yeah then a combined is a better option exactly. when you are planning a cataract surgery because of two reasons. One thing is you cannot give PG analogs. So you have only other three other options. We as glaucoma surgeons would like to keep one drug in reserve so that if you get a steroid response, which can be as high as 90% in the long run for glaucoma patients, you just keep one drug in reserve for advanced glaucoma patients. So keeping that safety margin, if you have a cataract, it is preferable to do uh, combined rather than uh, yes. uh, clean cataract surgery. Also, if you get a complication like a postoperative shallow SE, in a one-eyed person, it's very difficult to manage if the fakic eye. So, pseudo fakic patient, it's much easier to manage yeah. SE deformation and all this. So, I would now request Dr. Siddharth, who has very interesting videos <laughs> in his you laptop, and <laughs> so is, it will be a fake com Yes, sir. The, the question is, uh, you are talking about phacomorphic glaucoma. Both are. Phacolytic, I have seen my experience 30 years, even when the pressure is very high, it remains, uh, it presents as deep chamber, and even though little inflammation is there, it usually doesn't give rise to synechia formation. It is the phacomorphic glaucoma, where probably uh, combined cataract and glaucoma uh, indications are uh, are there. But even then, in the early phase, when the patient is presenting within two, three weeks, it's uh, better to do only uh, cataract surgery. It is when inflammation is there, and probably it has made 
synechia formation, the peripheral anterior synechia formation. So that kind of situation probably people is. So the decision has to be individualized. Mm -hmm. if, if we consider that there's a lot of inflammation is there and a single surgery might not help, we might as well in select situations go ahead. But otherwise, by and large, probably a cataract surgery will help. Okay, I would now request Dr. Siddharth uh, with his presentation. Uh, there was an under-19 player in uh, 2014 World Cup. He was the Indian captain for the Indian team, Unmuk Chand. Greg Chappell said at that point of time that this guy is so talented, he should directly go into the Indian 11 without any further experience. So he's right now in the US playing in the US league. He, he didn't have a very great career. At the same point of time, Sunil Gavaskar has also said that this guy is going to get into the Indian team. There are situations when we see and when we feel something, but then numbers don't lie. I think uh, there are multiple studies where in phacomorphic glaucoma, sir, I would also be on Dr. Mandal's side. It has been shown irrespective of how much synechia you have and for a duration of presentation of one month or lesser, plain cataract surgery works. Not only in terms of intraocular, the intraocular pressure control was better, the intraop complications were lesser and this was uh, the post-op complications were lesser. So in all aspects, we have a very strong recommendation to have, uh, because we were earlier doing combined surgeries for patients who presented beyond seven days. So we had a good comparative sample. So with that, I will move to uh, the topic that I have, FACO emulsification with glaucoma drainage device. Thank you, Dr. Debashish, for having me. Uh, I will cover my top uh, talk under these sections. Now, unlike uh, combined surgeries where if you have a significant cataract, sometimes when you are operating the cataract, you also do a trabeculectomy. This is a situation that is different. Here, you would do a phaco emulsification along with GDD only when the GDD is indicated. So the indications here basically are indications that are same as those for a glaucoma implant. And if there is a significant cataract, you also do the cataract surgery along with the glaucoma drainage device. Uh, again, except for situations like neovascular glaucoma and uveitic glaucoma, you would be a little skeptical about doing if they are not well controlled. If they are well controlled uh, neovascular glaucoma, well controlled uveitic glaucoma, you can do the cataract surgery also along with that. There are certain advantages. The biggest advantage in terms of implant surgery, if you are doing a uh, Cataract, uh, cataract surgery along with it is that you make the sulcus available for the placement of the tube. Now the biggest problem that we usually face apart from glaucoma related problems in implants is the corneal endothelial cell loss. And the sulcus is such a nice place to put the tube in is that is, that is so much preferred over the uh, is anterior chamber placement. And as we discussed, it is easier to manage complications, complications associated with uh, shallow anterior chamber also, you give the patient a feeling of improvement in visual acuity, which you can't give with just a, a glaucoma surgery. And when you combine two procedures, you're all, always uh, reducing the number of OR and OPD visits for the patient, so it benefits them also. There are certain challenges uh, or disadvantages that you can have. Any complication in cataract surgery may affect the success of the glaucoma procedure also. So it is very important to have as minimal complications especially those which can cause more inflammation uh, to, uh, to be avoided. The operating time is uh, a little longer. For, uh, for a surgeon who is not a cornea or retina surgeon, anything more than 30 minutes, the brain kind of goes into a freeze. So that time increases. Also, in a patient, when you're doing a combined glaucoma and uh, cataract procedure, you, I would recommend not to use the toric IOL. As the bleb evolves, as the pressure goes up or down, the astigmatism is going to change. So a torico IOL cannot be placed along with a tube, but if you have a patient who has had a tube uh, an year back and you now have a stable intraocular pressure, you have a stable keratometry, you can place a toric IOL later. Uh, multifocal IOLs, of course, are a strict no-no for patients with, uh, uh, the, uh, with glaucoma. And uh, you have a greater need for steroids in patients when you do a cataract surgery. Whereas in patients with a tube where, which is 
Dr. Mandel always keeps saying that glaucoma surgery is an extraocular procedure almost because the only time you enter is when you make an osteum or put the tube in. So there is a lesser need of steroids in glaucoma procedures uh, if you compare with uh, the uh, cataract surgery, especially when you have a steroid response. Then you will have to have a balance between the two. The surgical technique needs to be modified a little bit when you are doing an implant along with the cataract surgery. So you have to manipulate the globe, pull the globe up and down, uh, fix it, and while you're fixating the implant eight millimeters behind the limbus, the globe has to be pulled up. You don't want to do all that in a globe which has an open cataract incision or even a paracentesis. The AC can shallow, and when, while you're not looking at it because it's really under the lower lid, things may happen. So you don't want to do that. That is why you fixate the implant before opening the globe so that you don't have to go really that posterior. Also, it is usually preferable to do a temporal incision for your cataract surgery and suture it. Of course, any glaucoma surgery can cause shallowing, so you want to suture it. Shallowing can also be a problem when you're using hydrophobic uh, foldable IOLs, which don't have that much of a rigidity, uh, and that is why the rexis, when you do a combined surgery, is also slightly smaller. It won't make a three millimeter rexis, which makes your phaco very difficult, but something around 4.5, 4.75, which has a greater security for your IL that, that it will stay behind. And as I said, no multifocal or toric IELs in these patients. So this is a video by Dr. Sirisha, who was actually supposed to do this talk, but has been generous enough to share this video. So it basically starts with a traction suture. Uh, it, 8-0 vehicle can be used for the traction suture. The incision you can see here is being made at the limbus but it can be made uh, 4.5, uh, 4 to 5 millimeters behind the limbus, also giving you greater security of thicker tenons. And then uh, we use a Stevens tenotomy scissors to dissect the conjunctiva in the pocket, conjunctival pocket, and then place the implant there. The basic thing is the implant should go and sit there. It should not be peeping out of that conjunctival pocket. And if it keeps peeking out, it means that the space has not been created well enough and you are, have a greater chance of implant related implant dislocation hypertensive phase mm -hmm. and you have to prime an agv here this is a fp7 model and after priming when when you have made sure that the valve is patent you just push it back uh, we use a 9-0 proline suture to fixate the implant 8 millimeters behind the uh, limbus and put around 7 to 8 knots in the proline suture. After that, the phaco emulsification can be carried out in a standard manner. Uh, of course, you have to be careful that uh, you don't have complications. The, uh, the rexis is being performed here. And then the phaco emulsification is completed in the manner uh, the surgeon uh, prefers to do it. Thoracortical wash is a must in any combined surgery. So in a cataract surgery, leaving a little bit of cortex is okay. But in a combined surgery, you want minimal inflammation. Don't leave any viscoelastic behind. Don't leave any cortex behind. So we are very particular of that. Uh, needle track is made with a 24 gauge needle. You place it at the limbus, the tube, and cut it, uh, leave a two millimeter residual length beyond the uh, incision. A 10 0 cross suture or a box suture can be placed to fixate the tube, and then a graft is placed in such a manner that it covers the entire track of the tube. There are multiple ways of uh, suturing the conjunctiva, but after the uh, IA, basically, you can use a combination of interrupted and continuous suture using 8-0 Vicryl to close the conjunctival incision. This incision also has to be watertight because there will be some fluid that will flow anteriorly. So this patient, as you see, is doing very well. Post-operatively, uh, we typically use prednisolone acetate if the patient is not a steroid responder. A patient who is a known steroid responder or you get a steroid response which is identified by presence of a good spongy bleb, 
but the pressure going high very soon after initiating the steroids, we can shift to lotiprednol and uh, taper it more rapidly. More antibiotic is given for a week, homotropin for, uh, for about two weeks, and nevanac is something that we typically, nepafenax is something that we typically use. There are two medications which are also indicated here. We typically give doxycycline to these patients for the first two weeks, 100 milligrams uh, uh, twice daily. 100 milligrams twice daily for the first two weeks. And the moment the intraocular pressure goes above 10 millimeters of mercury, we start one anti-glaucoma medication. It is known to reduce the extent, duration, and severity of the hypertensive phase. So I will stop here, especially with the reminder there. And we can possibly take the questions for both the topics at the end. Can we move on to the next presentation, please? Yes, yes, please. So as we talk about MIGS, I will be concentrating on uh, gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy because that is the mix that we uh, prefer to do. Uh, whenever you are choosing a mix, you can always combine it with phaco emulsification because uh, across these studies, no matter what implant you take, what mix you take, the, I, the combined surgery with phaco with mix either do as well or usually better than the mix alone. So our experience with GAT is, and the literature also suggests that GAT alone and FACO with GAT, they work equally well. So again here, uh, these are all indications of trabeculectomy. So uh, any surgery where you need to do a combined uh, cataract and trabeculectomy can be used as an indication for doing a GAT. The only thing is that, one, the angle should be open and the patient should not have uh, angle closure of course, and the patient should not be on very strong anticoagulants because you do see a bleed in all patients with GAT and that can be uncontrolled if you have a very strong bleeding tendency or a bleeding diastasis. The interesting indication is that even after a failed TRAB and a failed AGV, you can go and do this because you're not dependent on the conjunctiva for this surgery. And of course, the indication, socioeconomic indications, the analogy that you have uh, for uh, trabeculectomy. The advantage of doing a combined surgery is one that you have a better access to the angle. You can see the, the angle widen up immediately after a phaco emulsification. Very often, when you start doing gonioscopy, you will realize that after almost every surgery, there is a little bit of blood in the Schlem's canal, which helps you identify it better, especially in the nasal area where you have the uh, most number of collector channels and visual acuity improvement and lesser visits. Uh, complications will cause a problem and there are two special problems that can be associated with uh, FACO and combined GAT is one thing, when you put the surgical gonial lens on the eye, these incisions may sometimes interfere with visualization of the angle, especially if you've gone really anterior or you, you have uh, DM folds during the surgery, something has happened and that can spoil your GAT. Uh, and never do GAT without a very good, perfect visualization of the angle. And then if you have high FEMA, we have seen cases where the blood has migrated behind the IOL and it actually disappears over a period of four to eight weeks, but can cause significant lowering of vision while it is there. And the patients are unhappy uh, with that. Uh, so I'll just play this video so that you can see the surgical technique. Phaco emulsification is carried out in a completely normal way. There's nothing special that uh, takes place here. Uh, and I said I make a slightly smaller axis whenever I do a glaucoma surgery along with uh, a cataract. And here you can see a direct job being done. Uh, four quadrants are made and uh, they're eaten up soft cataract, so it's not a problem. Uh, glaucoma surgeons like to rush through their cataracts and then come to the agenda, so that's what I'm doing. Now, while we come to GAT, I would also like to share my five top takeaways for GAT. Uh, one I have already mentioned, it's very important that you never do this surgery till you are seeing the angle perfectly well, especially when you, when you are beginning. And, uh, okay, let's, let's go through the surgery now. 
this is a indian hydrophobic lens that we have placed now so this is the site of the paracentesis that i have made and the paracentesis needs to be made exactly opposite to the site where you intending to make this goniotomy the goniotomy typically should be located within uh, area of 90 degrees in the nasal uh, nasal part because that is where the most number of collector channels are there so because i am sitting superiorly i am doing it inferior nasally and that is where i make an additional paracent is never compromise on your access because that can cause a significant problem it's a woke uh, goniol gonio lens that i that i have placed here and you can, as you can see here i am using a new uh, perfectly sharp mvr blade to access the angle so after visualization of the trabecular meshwork right in the center of your field you should make around 1 to 2 clock hours of goniotomy also just push it down to make sure that it is actually uh, you see a, a, a canal there and then uh, this incision is made to give access to the suture which is curved and uh, the second take away is that always put your instruments in the eye before you put the surgical gonio lens because the surgical gonio lens will uh, interfere with the entry and exit and then you can have a need to remove and uh, put it back and all that so always have the instruments in the eye before you put the surgical gonio lens at an angle of around 10 to 15 degrees so this suture is almost parallel to the trabecular meshwork when you start pushing it into the eye and you can see it going into the trabecular meshwork and it should passed with small amount of resistance if there is no resistance you have probably gone back if there is significant resistance you are probably going up you should not see any undulating movement of the iris uh, at this point of time now the view is a little hazy and uh, people who are observant would have noted that the gonio lens is a little dirty which i'll probably clean during this surgery so i was looking being lazy looking through other parts till this point of time when i thought okay let's not compromise and that is the uh, first rule that i have broken myself don't do this and uh, if you see there are folds at one or two points in this surgery always have the anterior chamber completely full with a cohesive viscoelastic otherwise you will keep getting bleeds the visualization will be difficult uh, don't compromise on that also so you see the other end of this thing coming out and you see a complete 360 degree goniotomy uh, after this uh, you do a visco wash while making sure that the eye does not become hypotonus the moment the eye become hypotonus you will see a bleed happening from all around so at no point of time should the eye become hypotonus before you take out your irrigation just start hydrating the wounds so that the anterior chamber is always tight and leave the eye a little tighter than normal now post operatively we give uh, minimal steroids in fact uh i have shifted to just if i don't combine it with a uh, feco mm -hmm. i give lotiprednol four times a day for one week and stop and moxifloxacin nevenac is uh, nepafenac is the same the important thing is that this surgery needs pilocarpin after the surgery for two weeks without pilocarpin the success rate is likely to come down over a longer period of time uh, fortunately we are getting pilocarpin in the market again uh the brand name is pilokite and it should be available all around uh, uh very soon so i think delayed but definitely the glaucoma community in india is moving towards mix and and there is no doubt that the coming decade will belong to mix because if you look at the outcomes for surgeries like gat and a few other uh, uh, good surgeries that you have here some of these require expensive uh, devices whereas gat requires a suture that that you can make in your own hour so i think this is very exciting prospect and uh, we are all looking forward to it uh, thanks dr siddharth that was really interesting and uh, we are all interested about this new era of this mig surgeries so um, uh, in your experience what are the patients that you would uh, advocate uh, feco with gat Uh, so for uh, few of us who are doing gat uh, it has become the primary surgery for all opening open angle glaucomas 
it is more important to know what patients we would not want to do this surgery in. So there are three contraindications. One thing is any angle closure, just don't do it because it is not about opening the angle. The iris itself in the angle closure patients is different. It is much like, more likely to go and block the cleft that you have made. The second thing is patients who have high chances of getting uh, a bleed. So patients with known bleeding disorders on, on more than uh, one antiplatelet medications, also something that is not good. And third thing is a personal choice that I think uh, any patients with any residual silicon oil in the anterior chamber, we should not be operating uh, doing this procedure or any angle-based procedure because it is going directly into our blood stream. It will go into your heart and can be a possible source of embolism. We don't want to do that. So these are the three contraindications for me. Okay. Uh, and what is the suture you're using and uh, how are you making the tip blunt, all those things? Okay. Uh, so basically, these are 5-0 proline sutures which is available from Orolab. So these are commercially available sutures, but you can actually make it, you can, <coughs> sorry, either use a heated uh, blunt instrument like the iris repositor or any spatula. Once under microscope, you take it close, you will see that it's getting that umbrella kind of a shape. So if you have a commercially available suture and you try to prepare and match that commercially available suture a few times, you will realize it's not very difficult. We are doing that uh, ourselves now because the supply was, it's not, it's available widely now, but it was a little challenging in between. Okay, and how difficult it is to cannulate the Schlem's canal, uh, I mean 360 degree? I, so I, I would like to yes. believe that if I can do it, anybody in this world can do it. I, I, have, I have no special blessings or skills. I am I'm as ordinary as anyone. What is important is you should need to need, should know how to do a gonioscopy and identify that uh, angle. Uh, quite surprisingly, I had not realized that I'm not seeing the trabeculum mesh work as well as, as one is required to see it. So be very, very sure of it. Watch multiple videos on the internet and see, make a visual imp uh, impression of how the trabeculum mesh work should look when you're doing this surgery. And only when you see that, proceed with surgery. A very good way to start is, say, if you're doing a phaco emulsification on right eye of a patient, put a gonio lens on the left eye, look at the angle, how it is looking. And then later on, once you are comfortable with gonioscopy, you can proceed with uh, the surgery. Okay, that was excellent. We are really excited about these uh, new procedures. Uh, uh, Dr. Siddharth has mentioned he is using it as a primary surgery, surgical procedure when he is uh, contemplating combined cataract and glaucoma surgery. And also when the glaucoma surgery has failed, a phacotrabeculectomy or SIC strap has been done earlier and the patient has come with high IOP. So conventionally you would start with anti-glaucoma medications and then if it's not controlled, you would plan a second repeat phacotrab or even a glaucoma drainage device. So this is, uh, it, it does not involve the conjunctiva so there lies the advantage you can do this procedure at that point of time also right okay so right right uh, so there is a lens called the tvg gonio lens it is the best but also a very expensive surgical gonio lens and in ror we keep fighting for it uh, so if you use it once then it has to go into etu and it's available 24 hours later so the tvg lens is the best uh, but you can use iCamad surgical gonio lens also. There is also a surgical gonio lens which is available from Vogue. So you can use any of these. You can, uh, but TVG lens is, is the best. It stabilizes the globe really well. What is the angle morphology after the post-op? We, uh, Rashmi has a publication uh, in ophthalmology glaucoma which is, uh, uh, available for free. It's got a very beautiful gonio photo. You see a cleft where you would see the uh, trabeculum meshwork and it appears identical to a trabeculum meshwork tear. So it, it's, it's like a gap. If you see, make a slit optical section and see, it's like a uh, tunnel in the place of the trabeculum meshwork. Okay, so I think... Um we have finished the program in time and if uh, there are any questions, we'll take that. 
or else we would uh, thank Dr. Mandal and Dr. Siddharth for this excellent deliberation of the uh, topics and thank you everybody. If there are one or two questions, we can take that and then we can conclude. While the, probably the next set of speakers can yes. keep moving in. Okay, thank you everyone.